I'll uh, have to introduce myself now. I'm uh, Kai de Vos. I'm going to speak about the uh, new red programming language that uh, we have been developing for the past uh, one and a half years uh, now. I don't have, uh, most of the presentation uh, is not very flashy, it's uh, text based. So uh, I've, uh, I've put the letters uh, quite big so that everyone should be able to read it and it should come out uh, well on the recording. But uh, I'm going to uh, scroll around the, the screen uh, during the presentation and uh, get the, the program text uh, in the picture in the, on focus. The thing is, uh, how many of you were here this morning for the Scratch Web? presentation. Okay, so uh, I named my presentation uh, similarly, not because I had seen them, but because uh, uh, it, uh, it, it felt like a good idea, uh, programming for uh, common people. But it's not really the same way as Scratch Web. It's not a, a visual uh, integrated development environment, at least uh, not at this moment. That would be a, a long-term goal. But at this point, it's a traditional programming language that is, uh, that is really text-based. But still, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly similar to Scratch Web, in my view, because uh, you saw the, uh, the IDE open, and you saw visual elements being dragged uh, onto a canvas, but it was not really a canvas, it was more like a, a program script. And uh, the difference was that the IDE uh, understood the, the structure of the program script. And then there was a, a second uh, pane where the, uh, the, the output appeared. And then there was a really nice trick that you could transfer that program to run on a website. So there must be some technically advanced stuff uh, going on underneath. And that is actually... Uh, an ideal of, uh, of the red programming language, something we're working towards. But at the moment, uh, it's text-based. And uh, uh, if you think back about the Scratch Web presentation that also uh, ran, uh, as far as I could see, in a, in a somewhat specialized environment for uh, 2D graphics and maybe some, uh, uh, maybe a little <coughs> physics engine, I'm not sure. But there were some, uh, some special commands in there to, to quickly get uh, 2D animations and, uh, and objects interacting with each other. And uh, from my point of view, that is a, a, a domain-specific language. You're constructing an integrated development environment with basically a, a script language that you're sort of handling visually, but you could still see the, the command names and the, the, the numeric parameters within the, the visual structure of the script. And it was fairly specific for a 2D animation. So that is a language that's for a, a fairly specific purpose. And the point of the red programming language is that it's fundamentally designed to design domain-specific languages. So I'm not. Sure, I don't know how Scratch Web is implemented. It must be uh, technically advanced the, the, by the features that it has. Um, but uh, our experience with the red lineage of programming languages, which I'll say more about soon, uh, is that uh, very few programming platforms support this at a really fundamental level. And uh, uh, red is designed to be able to quickly write domain-specific languages. So in the future, it should be possible to write a scratch web-like uh, dialect. And if you were then to make a visual uh, development environment for it, it could be, it, it could, could resemble scratch web eventually. Um, and similar things have been made in the past. Um, but the thing is that you could also make a very different dialect. Red is really a language designed for designing domain-specific dialects. And if you're into, uh, into language research uh, academically, 
that is more or less known as the, the holy grail of language research. There have been uh, some very uh, popular domain-specific dialects uh, over time, but there are just a few of them. One very popular one is, uh, is uh, SQL, a domain-specific dialect for programming databases. And it was a very early dialect and a very powerful one and also a very specific one. So that has become uh, very popular, so popular that most people don't even think about it as a domain-specific dialect. And uh, there are a few more. Make, for example, it's a special language for uh, for, uh, for building other software or building generic things really uh, and those few are very uh, popular but there are many many more and especially in recent years there's really a, an explosion of programming languages but almost every time you see if you look at the implementation you see that everything is done almost from scratch Scratch web, but scratch. And because that's too much work, most of them these days are built on the Java virtual machine or their uh, 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 .NET language so that you don't really have to redo the underlying platform. But many people want to make new languages uh, the way they want them to be for their domain. And many of them are even general purpose, but there are even more little languages uh, professional games, uh, many of them have a, a small language built in for writing extra levels and stuff like that. Those are all domain specific languages and most of the time there are a lot of work to implement because you have to make an entirely new language almost from scratch. And uh, the aim of RED is to clean that all up, collapse that into one platform in which you can much easier make domain-specific languages. <coughs> now I have to tell that uh, this is from a lineage of programming languages. Red is uh, very much inspired by Rebel. <coughs> I think a few of you have heard of it. It's designed by the uh, old designer of the Amiga operating system. And that's where it gets its low-level design. It's really meant to be able to implement an operating system. So every, every software that can run on a computer should be implementable in Rebel. And we'll, we'll see where that falls short sometimes. And one of the biggest things where it falls short is that it has never been, um, been open sourced. But I'll start by showing what we're working towards. This is Rebel 2 and this is version 2 of it. So you get a, a graphical uh, environment which is meant as its own desktop. You can already see that it, uh, it tries to build its own uh, isolated uh, island. And there are some demos in there. I'm not sure not all of them work. But you have a lot of built-in uh, functionality, a lot of graphic stuff. Because, of course, this, in his mind, this was the follow-up of the <coughs> Amiga operating system. And that was uh, a lot about multimedia and, uh, and games. But you can also write uh, business applications with it, a small address book. And this is uh, almost 15 years uh, under development. This is more than 10 years old already. From the start in 2002, we got the uh, graphical environment on Rebel. And personally, I always expected it to, to be open source eventually. And it may happen in the coming few months, but we're still not sure. So a year and a half ago, we were really fed up. And uh, a guy who uh, is very knowledgeable about Rebel started his Red project. But that's more than 10 years after, uh, after Rebel came into being. So there's a new plan for making it better than Rebel. 
of what probably gets a, a bit complicated, but Rebel is an interpreter. And that has a number of consequences. It means that it's very uh, dynamic in nature, which you need to implement these domain-specific dialects. And uh, um, it also means it's slow. And it also means that sometimes it falls short of the idea that you should be able to live in Rebel and, and build an operating system in it as a follow-up of the Amiga OS. And those are two big reasons that it, it hasn't really caught on, especially in recent years. It's, it hasn't been open sourced. And uh, when you want to, to write really low level stuff or fast stuff, you have to switch to a low level language anyway. So you have the problem that at some point you need to switch back to C. And uh, many, many people uh, are into Rebel because uh, they can't ha handle other programming languages. So uh, it's really clear that Rebel enables more people to program. And that is similar to Scratch Web. Our, our goal is to enable more people to program because they can program at their abstraction level in their domain of expertise. So they shouldn't be bothered with all the underlying technology. I'll go into it one more time to, to illustrate it. We go back to this uh, bubbles demo. If I right click on it, I can just edit it <coughs> and I can, uh, can see the source. And here's another reason why we have to do it ourselves because uh, after 15 years the fonts are still uh, horrible on Linux. Because it's, uh, it's cross platform as you saw in the graphics. Uh, the very same script runs on Windows and on Mac. But uh, if you really get down to it, the fonts are so ugly on Linux and it still hasn't been fixed that, yeah, it's, it's really a blocker. But you can see for the graphics that we just saw, it's just one, one page of code. So uh, uh, this, this can be so short because it's full of domain-specific dialects. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how generic Scratch Web is, but Rebel is full of little dialects for specific purposes. Let's see if we can find a few. Here's a, a, a tuple notation that is being used for a, a pen uh, <coughs> color, I think. And there's a random funci function to get some game-like functionality going. And there are special data types for a pair, for example, x by y, so you can have there's a special data type for screen coordinates, basically. And then here you see more, uh, here's a pair, 150 by 150, so that's a special data type, unlike most other languages. And here are tuples for color. And then here are uh, dialect words for, uh, for the graphics. Fill pen, radial, circle. And then right through it is normal programming. And here's the main graphics function where all that is started. And uh, 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 a part of a, a window is called a face. So here you view the faces that constitute the demo, and again with parameters, a pair 400 by 400 probably for the box size. And here are a little mini dialects just inlined in the other code for an effect. So you say I also want an effect, and then the effect word starts an inlined mini dialect where you have gradient and the pairs and color tuples. So if you're familiar with other languages, this probably looks quite different. And uh, you could be excused for thinking that it's a very specific domain, specific language, because there are so much graphic stuff in it. But the trick is that this is really a general purpose programming language. It's a functional language, very much like uh, Lisp and Scheme, but actually a more dynamic and a more user-friendly syntax 
But the trick is that uh, inlined everywhere are smaller, more specific dialects. And here it becomes very essential that uh, everything, as I said, is, is designed on the same base. Because if you have one language for database access, as you well, and you have another language for building your software and, and other files, then it becomes very hard to inline them in each other. And we've probably all seen uh, the examples. Uh, HTML, some people think of it as a programming language, although it's not Turing complete. But you can inline JavaScript in HTML. And JavaScript is Turing complete, so then you can claim that your web application is a complete programming language. But if you look at how the JavaScript is inlined in the HTML, they're two completely different languages. And it doesn't stop there, because for, uh, uh, to separate the content from the presentation, you have CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. And because that's so specific for the, the, the presentation, it is its own language. But it's a completely, CSS is a completely different language from HTML. So to write a complete web app these days, and Scratch Web generates that some way, so that's technically very advanced. There's a lot going on underneath that you can't see. But in a, in a typical web app, you have at least three completely different languages inlined in each other. You start with HTML, uh, you need CSS for the presentation, and you need JavaScript to make Turing complete for the real program. And that gets uh, very messy very quickly. And then uh, if you add to that all the, the different browsers that implement those more or less standards, more or less differently, it's really, really frustrating to program web apps. And this is actually, Rebel is also network enabled because uh, this is where you can uh, put your local uh, programs. But the demos were actually downloaded from the web and under public you have a library, oh no, it's on the sites where people can uh, register uh, websites and the idea was that it was going to be a new world wide web but as I said it's not really caught on and a lot of these sites don't exist anymore so it's really a graveyard now even if this is a well known person in the community but even that is not there anymore oh this is still here and this is actually uh, this is downloaded like a website, and then you get it cached locally. And here's actually a MySQL driver, and this is actually uh, Doc Kimball. This is the guy who is now doing Red. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, to give you an uh, idea of what we're trying to uh, replace. So I'll uh, quickly go uh, into the real Red stuff. Um, It's actually becoming more graphical uh, than I thought. Um, let's see what's the best place to go. Uh, I have a, a builds directory here. Um, looks we are right. This is where the, uh, the built uh, applications are going to end up most of the time. It's uh, empty now. Um, let's find uh, one of the programs. stuff. Uh, uh, over the past year and a half I've made a lot of bindings for uh, Red to uh, common uh, open source libraries. You'll probably recognize some of the names. Not all of them are different, <coughs> but a very basic one here is a binding with uh, the common C library. And I have 
have some examples in there. And I made them for seven or eight different languages, including Rebel and, uh, and Red and Ruby, uh, to compare them and, uh, and see. And here's the, the current Red version. And it's just the, uh, the well-known uh, Fibonacci uh, function uh, to test some uh, integer uh, arithmetic and to test uh, how fast the function calling is. And uh, on top is uh, a, 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 a header, similar to what you saw in the Rebel example, but a bit more extensive, but this doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is the, the red uh, header to mark it as a red program, similar to the, uh, the Rebel header. And this is just metadata. You can in, this, is, uh, this is the first dialect, really. This is a, a small dialect for metadata, so you can add uh, meta tags, uh, what you want to your program, and these are actually standardized, but only by convention. You could use entirely different names with your own metadata if you need it. And because it's all the same syntax and semantics, uh, you could read that data, metadata from the program itself. So the metadata doesn't really matter that much. The real program is in here. And uh, this is in a, a somewhat uh, odd uh, system clause. And that is the signal that uh, red is the, the, the language uh, more or less at the level of rebel. And the first code for it was published only a, a half a week ago. So it does very little yet. What we have now is a red system which is actually a, a dialect of red and it also looks uh, uh, very much like rebel because it's also really a dialect of rebel and here in the system clause you can inline red system code in red and because red doesn't do much yet at the moment uh, I'm here showing the red compiler but really with a red system program within it and Red System is a, a, a low-level language, very much on the level of C. So with Red System, we're actually replacing C. Before we go on to the higher level to replace Rebel with Red. And uh, that may sound like an, an odd venture to replace C, but it uh, is actually working out very well over the past year and a half, because uh, a higher level language needs to be implemented in a lower level language. And you can bootstrap it and eventually write it in itself. Uh, but you must start with a low level language at least to give it performance. And uh, the, the current Red System compiler uh, is actually written in Rebel, in the bootstrap phase. But it generates Red System code to, uh, to uh, get a, a good performance level. So you can think of it as generating C code, what a lot of other language compilers also do. But we got rid of the impedance mismatch by implementing Red System first. We don't need C, but we have uh, the same uh, functionality to implement your higher level language in it. So this is a, a Red script inlining a Red System program. If I uh, try to <coughs> compile that with the uh, red compiler, you can see that it does it in two phases. Uh, first, it, uh, it calls uh, the red compiler. Uh, the red compiler uh, compiles it to uh, red system code, and then it is passed on to the red system compiler. And then you get the, sec the second compilation phase, which uh, uh, lasts quite a bit longer because, uh, uh, because Red is a high-level language. Uh, a lot of uh, low-level code is generated by that. And currently, that's mainly uh, the runtime because we only inline that small Red system program. And you can see that the, uh, the output file size at the moment is 35 kilobytes. So that's really very small for, uh, for a program these days. And it's here now. And we can start it. 
and it is hardwired to uh, to uh, to compute uh, the Fibonacci number of uh, 35. And if we now take the equivalent program put in Rebel. We run that with uh, the REBEL2 that we already saw before with its graphical interface. You can see that it's not as fast. While the code is, uh, is really very similar. I'd like to show more, so I'll, I, I'd like you to believe that the uh, Fibonacci examples that you see there the R1 in Rebel, the red one and the red S1, which are currently both really red system, uh, are really very much alike. They, they're, 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 they almost look the same. But because the red system language is such a low level language, <coughs> it runs really, really faster. Uh, this takes 34 seconds in, uh, in Rebel, which is interpretive. And if I time this thing, You can see that uh, the red system program takes uh, a third of a second, about a third of a second instead of 34 seconds. So that's really uh, the performance difference between, uh, between Rebel and uh, between red system. And uh, red system is almost at the level of C. It's a simple compiler now, and it turns out that uh, it's as fast as when you let GCC uh, compile the equivalent C code without optimization. So it's really, uh, in the future, you should do optimization, but without optimization, we've almost reached the performance level of GCC. And if you let GCC compile with the usual optimization, it becomes about twice as fast. So we lose, at the moment, only half the speed compared to C, but that's only because we don't have an optimizing compiler yet. Okay, then the eventual target, the higher level uh, red language, uh, it's not an interpreter like Rebel, but it's a compiler. And as you saw, it compiles down to a red system code. So the performance of uh, RED is going to be somewhere between these two, between REBEL and between RED system. We don't know exactly where yet, and it can be opt optimized over time, of course. But that's uh, how, uh, how the three languages compare, because at the moment we're dealing with REBEL, because the RED system and RED compiler are currently written in it. We're dealing uh, with RED, which is our target language, and we're dealing with RED system, where it compiles down to. And if you uh, look in the source code of RED, the interesting thing is that it's... Let's look at my real screen. It's almost... Uh, Oh, this is my example directory, I have it in my home directory. It's a bit confusing, all those red directories. Here's the real compiler. It's split in, uh, in the red compiler and the red system compiler. <coughs> and here... Uh, you see uh, the compiler, which is a uh, .r, so the compiler is currently written in Rebel. And that should look familiar by now. And uh, this is the, the boot code, which is uh, written in red because it's part of the red uh, runtime. And that also looks familiar by now. There's no impedance mismatch between the impl current implementation language uh, Rebel and the red language that we're now creating, except that it has a different header at the top and some small differences that we're making uh, to, uh, to optimize decisions that were taken in Rebel 
maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And then if you look at the, the runtime of the RED compiler, you'll find a, a lot of RED system code in there. Uh, here are the, uh, the natives, for example. Those are the native functions. And that again looks familiar, but it has RED system on the top, so it's really a different language. This is the language that we saw in the Fibonacci example. And here you see that uh, uh, we have namespaces, what they're called in most other languages like C++. So although it's at the level of C, we're already going beyond it in advanced features that are inspired by Rebel, because Rebel does everything in contexts. And another language would call that a namespace, but uh, one goal of Rebel is to write very compactly. So we don't use the name namespace, we call it a context because it means the same and the word is shorter. So this is a context in which the, the <coughs> natives for RED are implemented, but the natives are written in RED system, the implementation language for performance. And here you can, for example, see the implementation of the print function. And I think this is a trampoline because this is not the complete print implementation but this is the global wrapper. If you call print in, uh, in red it first goes into this uh, trampoline uh, wrapper function. So that's really very small. And you have to to know the internal structure of the compiler to make sense of it, but it's so small that that can't be a lot of work to wrap your head around that. And you see that eventually uh, it does a, a, a print line. So eventually the high level red pr print function goes to the low level red system print line function. But before that uh, it has uh, tunneled the, the print call to the correct data type because uh, red is highly dynamic, uh, highly uh, polymorphic uh, so you can have different data types uh, series is actually a, a collection data type for a number of, uh, of series uh, type uh, data types so you see it asking the actual type uh, of which it is called and then it calls the, the print function, or at least the, the, the form function. Here you see that it, uh, it goes to a form function, because the form function uh, converts the data type to its printable format. So you get a string from that, and that is, goes to the red system print line function. <coughs> that is the implementation of the, the, the red print native function. And then to know how that is really executed, you have to go into uh, the data types implementations. And as I said before in the Rebel example, Re Rebel is a, a, a data type rich language. Uh, Red system is the low level dialect, so that uh, has uh, C data types. So it, it is uh, data type compatible with C, so you can write bindings with all the existing open source uh, C libraries like I did uh, but RED has uh, higher level data types and uh, their, their, their implementations are here uh, so uh, the most complete one at the moment is uh, the integer data type and like the, the print native it is implemented in RED system the print native uh, sees that you want to print an integer data type and then it relays that to uh, uh, the, the form action of the integer data type because form converts the data type to a string and then the print native can print that string so for the real implementation we have to look for the form uh, function here and again you have a namespace here just for the integer data type implementation and here is uh, form function, I'm not sure that's the main one. Here you saw it, see it doing integer arithmetic. Ah, here's the real form implementation. And here's a, a stack manipulation function. 
So here you see it do uh, uh, the real form function. And there's uh, a, a lot of the code is really just for debugging. And the complete implementation is again as small as the, the print wrapper for the polymorphic data types. And then you just see it uh, getting the integer from the boxed high level red data type. Uh, it, it also gets it from the stack first because it's, it's currently implemented as a stack machine. Uh, very simplistic at the moment, so no real uh, optimization. First, we need to make it work. So you see it get the, uh, the, the argument to form from the stack. Uh, then you see it cast it to uh, 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 the uh, integer data type because the data, the data type on the stack is polymorphic. And we have, uh, the print wrapper has established that it is an integer, but you have to cast uh, the, the top of the stack to that uh, integer data type. Uh, then you have to, for debugging, you check that it's really an integer like the, uh, the print uh, wrapper told you. Uh, then you unbox the value to uh, a, a red system, a low level integer data type. <coughs> And then you uh, convert it to, uh, to a string. And it does some uh, memory buffer manipulation here to, uh, to convert it <coughs> to a string. So here you have a, a macro. And uh, this works quite like uh, macros in C because we're at, at a, a, a C level in red system here. So this is a C-like uh, macro call to, uh, to, uh, to, to convert this integer to a string. And then you... Uh, you, uh, you uh, leave it in the right form uh, for the uh, print native to handle it and really print it, as we saw before. So that's basically how the, uh, how the red compiler works and how it is split in, uh, in poly polymorphic uh, trampoline functions. Uh, that tunnel to these uh, specific uh, red data type implementations. And a data type has a, a specific set of, uh, of, of, of methods, uh, if you want to call them such, because they're wrapped in namespaces, so other languages would call them methods. And uh, you can see that every data type should have a form action so that you know how to print it. So that's really uh, the structure uh, of the compiler. So it goes from the rebel implementation uh, of the compiler, which is really a script that is executed by the interpreter. So I can simply show it in the text editor here. And that is really how the interpreter is run, because it's currently a rebel script. Then you go to the, uh, the, the high level red code that is being compiled. But it, it looks almost exactly the same, but the dialects are slightly different because it's a slightly different language. And then the, the, the red code is compiled down to a red system dialect that uh, has a, a, a second compiler. The red system compiler, which has a very similar structure and very similar code. And the red system compiler is also written in Rebel, so it's also an, 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 a script that you can open and that is executed as a script currently by the Rebel interpreter. And it all looks almost the same. And the red system compiler eventually compiles it down uh, to, uh, to, to, to binary. There's no assembler in between because uh, red system has its own, <coughs> its own compiler and its own generator for target binary code and its own linker. So you completely bypass the normal uh, compiler tool chains that everyone uses. So you don't need uh, 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 GNU CCC, you, 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 you don't need GCC at all, you don't need a C compiler, you don't need the GNU bin utils, you don't need an assembler, you don't need a linker, it's all implemented in red. And at the moment, uh, the complete code is probably a little over 10,000 lines. Maybe, it's, it, maybe it goes towards 15,000 li lines now, I'm not sure. 
but it's really, really small. And it's, it includes a, a red compiler, a red system com compiler, uh, a, a code generator for uh, formats, uh, a code generator for uh, uh, ELF format, for uh, Linux and uh, the BSD systems, and for uh, our Syllable Desktop project that I won't talk about today. Uh, uh, PE format for Windows, uh, uh, a binary format for, uh, for Apple Mac, the Mach O format, and it has a really simple backend generator for uh, the ancient Intel Hex format from the early 70s, uh, so that you can load it into an, uh, 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 an Arduino, a very small 8-bit processor board. But this is just the back end to generate those uh, binary formats. Uh, I think the... Uh, oh, here's some, uh, some cross-platform adaptation code for uh, Linux uh, FreeBSD, which is unfinished. Uh, Darwin for Mac OS X. Uh, Windows. And... Uh, there should be syllable in here for syllable desktop, but I don't see it. That could be, oh, it's here. It should scroll, of course. Syllable desktop, also L format, but slightly a uh, few adaptations. And then the real meat, where is it? Library, formats, oh, probably, ah, targets. Here's the uh, uh, Intel backend. So this Intel generates the Intel binary code, what GNU Binutils normally does for you. And there's a backend for, uh, for ARM, which uh, supports almost all ARM CPUs currently on the market in Android and iPhone. Uh, so in the backends earlier, there should, there's also a, a, a Android support, but I don't think it has its own backend. It's just a few, a few modifications in the, in the configuration. And here you see another example. The configuration file is data, but in Revel, and thus also in, uh, in, in Red, code is data. So the configuration file is not XML or some horrible format. It's also just Revel, and also a dialect of Red. So here are some, uh, some settings for configuration backends. So you have uh, DOS, console, Windows GUI. <coughs> Doesn't do much yet. Uh, in the latest version you can, uh, which is not in this code branch, but uh, since a few weeks you can generate uh, shared objects for, uh, for Windows. So you can generate uh, Windows uh, dynamic libraries instead of just executables. Uh, Linux executables, uh, Android with just a few adaptations. The only adaptations for Android are in here. Uh, you will need a different starting address for your code and you need a different path to the system uh, runtime uh, linker. That's all the adaptation that's needed for Android. So it generates native uh, ARM code on Android. And there's a, a branch for, uh, for Linux on ARM, so it runs on Debian on ARM, for example. So here you can see the normal uh, Linux loader path, and that's the only thing that's different for Android, really. And for Syllable, uh, you see that uh, it has a different starting address. And actually, the, in Syllable, the runtime loader is in the kernel, while for Linux, it is in the C library. So on Syllable Desktop, you don't need to, to point to a, 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 a user space runtime loader because it's in the current. And here's the, uh, the configuration for OS X. It has some, some specifics. Uh, uh, Apple wants you to uh, align the stack to uh, 16, 16 bytes for SSE. So this is really a few <coughs> low level adaptations to make it work. And then in 10, 15 lines of code, you don't need GCC and uh, GNU Binutils anymore. And the effect of that is that um, if I recall that I compiled the Fibonacci thing, I haven't 
tried this in red yet, so this is going to be uh, exciting to see if it works. Uh, I'm compiling on Linux Mint, so uh, I got a, a Linux executable here. But if I uh, target uh, MS DOS, I should get a, a, a Windows console application. There it is, a, a .exe. And in the, in the code on uh, GitHub, in the, in the development branch, you can, uh, you can also uh, uh, compile a, a Windows DLL at the moment. In the coming weeks, that's going to be uh, extended to, uh, to Linux uh, shared library generation. So, what more can we do? I can uh, target uh, Android. And then I, uh, I overwrite my uh, earlier Linux Fibonacci uh, uh, executable because it, like uh, on, on main Linux it usually doesn't have a, a file suffix. So uh, you see that it's twice as big, uh, probably because uh, ARM binary code is uh, not as efficient as Intel code because the CPU itself is, is much simpler than an Intel CPU, but that means that the code is bigger. So on Intel you get smaller code, but on ARM you have a much simpler CPU and that's why it uses uh, so much less power than Intel and why it's in all those mobile phones and other embedded small stuff now. And another thing, this is my uh, pet project for the past 10 years, Syllable Desktop, which is uh, sort of uh, a cross between Linux and, uh, and BOS. And I pushed for uh, the modifications to be able to run Red System and, and the past few days uh, Red on, uh, on Syllable Desktop because it is an entirely different operating system to, uh, to Linux. We're using uh, all of the same open source uh, GCC and Binutils code and everything on Syllable, but uh, it's really its own kernel. So you're compiling to a really different operating system. So, uh, porting the Red System compiler to Syllable was uh, quite a bit of work and it took half a year to complete it because uh, we couldn't really prioritize it. Uh, but uh, uh, because Red compiles down to Red System, you'd expect Red code to run uh, very quickly uh, on Syllable Desktop and we only had to change the syscalls for the memory map interface because uh, the sys... Uh, Red tries to do things as low level as possible, so if possible, uh, syscalls are, are used instead of the C library. And that means that it's uh, a, a less dependent on, uh, on third-party code, but it also means that you have a, to make a small modification to make that syscall work on Syllable Desktop. So uh, this is how I get a, a Syllable executable. And the interesting thing is that Rebel doesn't run uh, in the Rebel 2 version on Syllable because it hasn't been open sourced. And Rebel 3 runs on, uh, on, on Syllable, but that's re not really necessary because we can cross-compile. The only thing I have to do is, is say, uh, dash T, and I can simply cross-compile. And uh, I can uh, transfer this file to Syllable and it just runs. And I can, uh, can target Android, and if you have ever uh, written an Android application, uh, the only, usually the only realistic way to do that is to, to cross-compile it, uh, and uh, Google supports uh, a cross-platform, <coughs> cross-development chain, so because uh, Google is not too evil, uh, you can develop Android applications from Linux, but if you want to uh, develop iOS applications, uh, Apple really wants you to buy a Mac mm. and an ex-developer uh, license and you need to develop the iOS uh, uh, application in, in their development environment or on their operating system, on their hardware. 
and the red the the red system backend for macOS circumvents that. Uh, I think it's OS X. No. We don't compile to iOS yet, but that should be a small step from compiling to uh, to the main uh, macOS. Oh. Um, what was the name? It's slightly different. It's something like Mac, Mac OS, probably. Uh, oh, yeah, right. I think you're right. Yeah. I haven't done this in a while. I think uh, the OSX target is uh, commented out and it's supposed to become the graphical target. But you're right, the current console target is Darwin because that's the OSX kernel. Excellent. And, uh, oh, it's somewhere between the size of the uh, Linux and the Android executables. So this is the only thing uh, you need to do to cross-compile to OSX, completely circumventing the Apple toolchain. And uh, a special thing uh, needed to be done for that, <coughs> but uh, Nenad Rukosovic, the, uh, the designer, he got it to work. And it's, uh, it's probably going to work the same way for iPhone. And we're not sure uh, Apple is going to be, they're not going to be happy with it, but we're not sure they're going to allow it in the App Store. But at least we will have the technical ability to cross-compile uh, from uh, from all uh, red platforms, from Windows and Linux and uh, uh, and, and OS X itself, uh, to OS X or to Silver Desktop, because you don't need anything. You don't need to set up the big tool chain, because normally you would have to uh, on Linux you would have to set up a cross compiling version of GCC and Binutils. That is uh, very complicated, uh, but it's even even worse to have to, in, 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 in bloat uh, terms, it's even worse to have to install the Android cross-development toolchain on your machine uh, to be able to, to cross-compile an app to Android. And it's really much simpler here. All you need at this moment is the maybe 15,000 lines of, uh, of, of, of Red and Red System compiling. Then I have to mention another thing. Uh, the, because Red is a compiler, it's not going to be as dynamic as Rebel. And to fix that, the third stage is a YIT compiler. So when the, the Red compiler is bootstrapped, uh, a, a YIT compiler will follow so that you can generate this code while your application is running. And that will give you almost the same flexibility as when Rebel code runs in an interpreter. And it will also mean uh, uh, that you will be able to compile the code uh, on your smartphone because the entire toolchain, which is extremely small, uh, will just run on your Android and instead of having to needing a, de a big development workstation, you can just compile programs down to native ARM code uh, on your Android phone itself. And here's where we expect problems with the, uh, the iPhone App Store. Uh, because we're probably not going to be allowed to put a YIT compiler uh, in it. And Windows 8 for ARM CPUs is currently forbidding uh, code generation. So everyone's really closing off their future uh, software distribution. And this is going to be a fight, but techni technically we're ready for it. So I, I'm, maybe I just uh, didn't quite pay enough attention, but, but you started talking about how um, uh, you have uh, reball scripts that sounds like it starts the bootstrapping of red um, and then is red as a compiler then self-hosting after that? Can it also then read the same? After it will, be, it will be rewritten. It's, a, it's an excellent question because if you look in the red roadmap on the website, uh, there's a 
Uh, you see there, there's a stage for uh, uh, rewriting the red compiler and then rewriting uh, the red system compiler and then rewriting the, the red compiler because we, we need to get rid of Rebel. Mm -hmm. But because uh, red is going to do almost the same as Rebel, certainly with the yet compiler, uh, the next stage is to rewrite the current red system and red compilers in red right. when it is capable enough for it. Mm -hmm. And then we will be bootstrapped and we will be completely rid of Rebel. So then we will be independent from that closed source code and we will be uh, able to run on platforms that, Red, that Rebel doesn't run on. And, and uh, I can quickly show some stuff I have compiled. Uh, here is uh, uh, my own web browser that I wrote in, uh, wrote in Red System. And it's, uh, it defaults to going uh, to the home page of the Red programming language. So here from only uh, a week ago or something you see the birth certificate for Red because uh, Red System is a year and a half old now and quite uh, mature compared to C uh, by now. Uh, but Red is uh, in its very early phases and the first code was released half a week ago. And here on the roadmap uh, you see uh, that uh, the Red System compiler is, uh, is really basically done, uh, including the linker backend. Uh, uh, there are different code backends mentioned here. Intel ARM, uh, the very small 8-bit code backend for Intel hex code is an experiment for our Arduino board, so it's at 15% in the roadmap. And we want to target JVM bytecode and .NET uh, CLR bytecode. Uh, at some point there will of course need to be a 64 bits code generated. Uh, the file formats are, uh, are mostly complete but not for uh, shared libraries yet. And eventually we want the complete abilities of normal uh, tool chains. And here at the top you see, here you see the second phase, the rewrite of the red system compiler in red, then the red compiler in, in red, and eventually the red yet compiler so that everything will be self-hosting. That's, that's the plan. And this is a, a web browser mm -hmm. that I, uh, I wrote uh, on a binding to GTK and the binding to the GTK WebKit widget. And if I show the code for that, that's an example of a, a dialect I have implemented in Red System. Uh, so that lives, uh, oh wait, that lives in, uh, oh no, it does live here. In my code repositories, uh, Red GTK uh, WebKit, here. Examples. This is the browser that you just saw. Again, the metadata header. Uh, it includes the, uh, the 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 WebKit binding, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like C, but in C uh, you have an ugly list of include headers. But this compiler knows that uh, the 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 WebKit binding is going to include the GTK binding, so you don't have to repeat that here and the compiler itself checks for, uh, for double includes. And then you, here you see a, a very a small dialect.